awesome it is to gather and sing the truth of the gospel. This morning we're going to be looking in the gospel of John. Uh, For those of you who have been with us a while, it is our regular habit here to preach through books of the Bible, and we've been in the gospel of Mark for a number of weeks, but we're going to take a a couple of weeks and look at John's uh, account of uh, the, the things concerning the last week of Jesus' life, and I want to recommend to you by way of uh, a resource, a couple resources, is this week we're trying to center our hearts on this holy week, this last week of Christ's life. We have prepared for you a holy week devotional, which is going to go through the gospel of John beginning today, and is going to incorporate uh, the things that we're going to be doing Thursday night and Friday night, and I would love to encourage you, those are available uh, in the back, to grab one of those and, and use that as a resource uh, this week. Uh, also, I, I posted on Facebook last night uh, a resource my family's used for a number of years, uh, an app for a smartphone called Easter Now. Uh, it's, it's presented by a, a group called Ministry Safe. It's a great resource, and if you sign up for the app all throughout the week in real time, as, as far as biblical scholars can tell, it will send you text message alerts to tell you uh, the the day and the time of day that that we believe that these various events happen. It's a good way for us to to keep ourselves reminded of this holy week, this week where our Lord gave his life as a ransom for ours. Well, this morning we turn our attention to John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, the triumphal entry, or the first Palm Sunday, it says this, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a colt's donkey, His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Would you please be seated as we pray? God, we pray that your spirit would illuminate the truth of this text. God, as we look at your word and we center our hearts and our minds on the events of the final week of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God, we pray that it would cause us to believe, that it would cause us to be bold to have confidence. God, even as we look around and see a world in chaos, that because of your word and your spirit inside of us, we would be courageous, bold in our understanding that you are faithful to accomplish all that you have promised your people. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As I stated before, this is the most significant week in our Christian calendar. Today marks the beginning of Holy Week. This term, Holy Week, maybe this is a new term to you. As as Baptists, we're sort of accustomed to thinking about Easter Sunday, but traditionally the church has, has observed this entire week, the final week of Christ's life. As far as we can tell, going as far back as to the third century, Christians begin to see the significance of setting aside time, not just to observe and to celebrate the resurrection, but to observe closely the week leading up to the resurrection. I think we have so much to gain by placing ourselves inside the lives of the followers of Christ as they walked with him during this final week of his life. There's no other week that's so carefully described in all of the scriptures as the week leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A third of the Gospel of Matthew is devoted to this one week period. A third of Mark's Gospel is devoted to this one week. A, a quarter of, nearly a quarter of the book of Luke is devoted to 
this final week of Christ's life. And almost half of the book of John, from John 12 to John 20, is, is uh, about the week, the last week of Jesus' life. There are a total of 89 chapters in all four of the Gospels, and combined 29 of those chapters are devoted to this one week, depicting for us the events which led up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. This is without a doubt the most important week in all of human history. It's the week that defines who we are as Christians. We are the people of the resurrection. And and so one of the things that we understand is that while next week we will sort of join our hearts and our minds with Christians all across the planet in observing Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, the reality is this. That's what we gather to do every single week. We gather every week to celebrate the truth of the resurrection that because Jesus Christ died for us and was raised from the dead that we can have eternal life and forgiveness and sins because of his work. And so we gather next week, uniquely so, but we gather every week to celebrate the resurrection. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been resurrected, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is is in vain. Paul says if Christ isn't resurrected, then every single thing that we are and everything that we do as Christians is in vain, but we know it's not in vain. Because of the resurrection, we have the promise of eternal life. This week begins as the Lord rides into Jerusalem in what has come to be known as the triumphal entry. It's a day that we commemorate as Palm Sunday. But in reality, it serves for us as the coronation of Christ the King. The passage we're looking at this morning, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem to take the position which was rightfully His. He was in every way the King over Israel. He, he was in every way the King of kings, the King of the world, the creator and sustainer of all life who was coming to usher in His kingdom A kingdom which was not of this world, but a kingdom which he would usher in through his death and resurrection. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, it it, it talks about the significance of this king. Paul says this in his letter to the Colossians, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Speaks to the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look to the account of the triumphal entry as Jesus rides into Jerusalem We should understand that this is in every way the coronation of a king. But this king was not like any other king. This was not a coronation that was like any other coronation. Typically a coronation is filled with ceremony and Splendor. A coronation is meant to communicate something to the people. And so when we think about a worldly coronation, the ascendant of a new monarch to the throne, it's filled with a depiction of wealth and military strength. We look at some of the coronations of the world. They're usually ushered in by hundreds, if not thousands, of chariots and soldiers. The presence of a new king would be announced with horns and with harps. In more modern times, kings and queens ascending to the throne are adorned with ornaments displaying wealth as a sign of strength. Someone attempted, Sotheby's actually, uh, auction house uh, uh, attempted to uh, ascribe a value 
to the ornaments, the regalia that the British monarchs use that are only used when a, a new king or queen is, is coronated. Those uh, artifacts or those ornaments known as the crown jewels are, are housed in the Tower of London, one of the most secure places in, in all of London. And Sotheby's auction house tried to ascribe a value and they went through this process of trying to determine what the worth of these jewels and these scepters and these orbs and these crowns, which are all adorned with, with gold and with, with fine jewels. And they, they worked diligently to ascribe a value to them and they came to the conclusion they're, they're without value. <laughs> they're so valuable that, that nobody could ever purchase them. No individual or no other country could ever purchase the crown jewels. They're not even actually to, to give to them a value. And these ornaments are worn only when a new king or queen ascends to the throne. Three of the five largest diamonds known in world history, will adorn the next king when he is coronated, when he is made king and he ascends. But the coronation of Christ, it, it was unlike any coronation ever before. A typical coronation is intended to draw attention to the strength and the power and the wealth and the dignity and the might and the glory of the soon-to-be king or queen. This coronation was intended to highlight his humility. It's no ordinary coronation because this is no ordinary king. As we go through our text this morning, I, I want you to take note that everything about this coronation is unlike anything that the world has ever seen because this king is different. It says in verse 12 of our passage, the next day the large crowd that had come to feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. It's coronation, it's different because Jesus knows that the path to ushering in his kingdom is not through an act of strength or might. Jesus isn't trying to usher in the fullness of the power of the kingdom of God through some historic military campaign. He's not coming trying to be some cunning politician whose ideology and whose, whose vision will unite all the people. He's not coming in any worldly sense at all. No, God's plan to reveal the power of his kingdom through his chosen king would come through his weakness, through his humility, Ultimately, through his torture, through his death on a Roman cross, Jesus knew he was going to die in Jerusalem. He was keenly aware of the fact that the religious leaders in Jerusalem had already for some time been plotting with the political leaders in Jerusalem to kill him. They wanted him dead. And this belief that the only response to the person and work of Jesus Christ was to kill him was only heightened a few days earlier when the masses gathered to celebrate the fact that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Beginning of chapter 12, John tells us that Jesus was in Bethany. Six days before the Passover, in the home of his friend Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead, and that they'd gathered there for a feast. It was at this dinner where Mary took an expensive jar of perfume, and she broke it, and she anointed the feet of Jesus, and she wiped his feet with her hair and what is perhaps the most beautiful picture of devotion to Christ that we see anywhere in the scriptures. This was, in every way, the beginning of this coronation, this ascension of Jesus as king. Because Jesus knew that the kingdom of God would be ushered in as he died at the hands of the religious and political leaders in Jerusalem. And so when it was time, 
Jesus said, let's go to Jerusalem. It's time for me to claim my kingdom, to usher in the the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God would begin advancing by calling people out of their own kingdoms, out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation, every kingdom of this world, and calling them to a citizenship in a, a heavenly and eternal kingdom. Jesus knew that this was the proper time. So on that night before Jesus rode into Jerusalem in his coronation, Mary begins the process of anointing the new king. After she does this, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray Jesus, he actually rebuked her by saying, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Judas rebukes Mary for this gracious and sacrificial act of anointing Jesus. He says, this is a waste of money. That ointment, it's worth a year's wages. You shouldn't waste that on the feet of Jesus. You should have sold that and given it to the poor. But John tells us that Judas had other motives. Judas Judas was in charge of the money bag. Judas was the treasurer. He had purposed in his mind that it was a waste of money because he personally would have better use for that money. Verse 7, Jesus tells Judas to leave her alone, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Jesus knew in every way that Jerusalem was where he would meet his death. And yet, as Luke tells us, Jesus had already set his face towards Jerusalem. Verse 9, going back to this account with Jesus and Lazarus says in the large cr- verse 9 of our verse it says when the when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there they came not only on account of him but also to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead this week of passions is in every way connected to Jesus raising of Lazarus. This was the miracle that nobody could deny. This was the miracle that everybody observed had to give account for. And one of the things that we see is that it was because of this miracle that Jesus began to be what he still is today, the most polarizing figure in all of world history. People came to one of two conclusions with regards to Jesus. Either we must worship him or we must kill him. We must follow him as Lord, or we must reject him as something evil. The raising of Lazarus was a very public event. Lazarus was a very prominent man in the area, and one of the reasons we know this is that there was a great crowd gathered at the death of Lazarus to mourn his death. By the time Jesus arrives, there were many people there who were mourning and wailing his death. And probably many of those who were there to mourn the death of Lazarus were those who also gathered to celebrate his resurrection from the dead on the night before Jesus rode into Jerusalem. So at the beginning of our passage this morning, it tells us that the day after this feast, the crowd was gathered to see Jesus, to see Lazarus, this dead man brought back to life. They had gathered to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. And as he was entering, they waved palm branches and they cried out, Hosanna. The word Hosanna means save us or save now. They were declaring this man has the power and the ability to save us. They were proclaiming, save us, Lord Jesus, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. It's becoming clear that there is, however, a disconnect between the type of king that Israel longed for and the type of king that God had sent them. The picture of waving palm branches for a conquering hero was not unique to this account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Almost 200 years prior, 
Jerusalem was not under Roman control, but they had been conquered by a, a group of Greeks known as the Seleucids. There was a great Jewish leader named Judah Maccabee who led a great revolt and recaptured Jerusalem. And as their leader rode back into the streets of Jerusalem after liberating Jerusalem from the Greeks, the people welcomed him back by waving palm branches. This is one historian's account of that day. On the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches, with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, with stringed instruments and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. So the people who knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, they gathered to receive their king in the same way that they had gathered to receive as a hero this great Jewish leader who had freed them from their captor some 200 years previous. But Jesus was not the king that they were looking for. Jesus was in every way the king that God had ordained for Israel, but he was not the king that they wanted. Israel was looking for a king who would come in power, in strength, in might, in majesty, and redeem them from their greatest oppressor. And that's exactly what they got. But they didn't recognize him because they didn't know what power and strength and might and majesty looked like. And they didn't understand what their greatest oppressor was. They thought that it was Rome. They were looking for a king who would come, as Judah Maccabee had, in military strength and political power and drive the evil Romans from the Holy Land in power and strength. They were looking for a king who was going to come on a, on a war horse to make war with the nations, to elevate Israel to a place of world prominence, even world dominance, maybe to destroy all of the other nations and finally elevate Israel as the crown jewel of God's achievement as he had made covenant with this people. What did they get? Homeless prophet. And the young donkey. John tells us in the very next verse that Jesus came not on a great war horse as Judah Maccabee had come, but on a young donkey. And then, just so that we would be clear on the purpose of his coming, John quotes the prophet Zechariah. Verse 15, where John says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a, a donkey's colt. It's a, it's a quote from Zechariah 9, 9. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, it, it says this. This is the, the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah concerning the coming king. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Remember, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. This king has salvation. Zechariah goes on to say, this king is coming humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Israel was looking for a king who would come in power and make war with the nations. Instead, they got a king who came in humility, who Zechariah said came to make peace with the nations. According to Paul, in the passage we looked at in Colossians, he came to make peace by the blood of of the cross. So as Jesus rode in to ascend to his throne, assume his rightful place as the king of Israel, the people gathered around him and they cut off branches from the palm trees and they spread them on the road and they were looking for a king who would save them. They're shouting, save us, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were proclaiming Jesus to be the one who could save they were proclaiming to Jesus, you are able, you are the king that we've been waiting for. 
as this great military leader, Judah Maccabee, he, he, he led this revolt and he removed the evil Greeks who were occupying our land. Lord Jesus, come in power, in might, and remove the evil Romans who are now occupying our land. Not understanding that while they were looking for a military leader to make war with the nations coming on a war horse, they got a suffering servant coming on a donkey to make peace by the blood of the cross. Well, we know that there were some there who believed the vast majority they did not. The vast majority, they missed it. Because Jesus was not the kind of king they wanted. We know the rest of the story. That this week would culminate in the eventual death of this king. Even as Pilate presented this king and said, Who do, who do you want me to release? Jesus, who's done nothing? Or Barabbas? the crowd shouted, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus, because they were looking for the wrong king. Actually, verse 16 of our passage this morning says even the disciples didn't understand it. It says his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. Even in the moment, the disciples didn't understand what was going on. Why would you ride in on the colt of a donkey? Why would you not ride in on power and, and, and ascend to the throne? Why are you not here to, to drive these evil Romans from our presence? Why are you not here as a conquering king? You can imagine the disciples after the death of Jesus and after the resurrection of Jesus and after Jesus continued to teach them and after Jesus ascended going, how could we have missed it? Now, finally, it all makes sense. Jesus had told them previously, this is how this is going to play out. I'm going to die. And if you want to follow me, you're going to have to die too. For in order to save your life, you must lose it. In order for the power of God to come for salvation of all who believe, I must offer my life as a ransom for yours. The interesting thing about this passage is that we know that the occasion why there were so many people gathered in Jerusalem in that particular season is that it was the time of the Passover. That God had done this miraculous work in the history of his people and they had been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. God raised up a, a redeemer, Moses, to lead his people out of captivity and after a series of plagues aimed at causing Pharaoh to understand God's power and his might and his willingness to deliver his people, God said to Moses, tell the people that I'm coming. This, this final plague, it's going to be the most serious, it's going to be the most harsh, the most intense. I'm going to come and I'm going to pass through and I'm going to claim the firstborn of, of every family as mine. And this night, the firstborn from every family will die. For my people, the people of Israel, you need to be prepared. Be ready. Because on this night, you're going to flee. I'm going to lead you out. I'm going to deliver you from captivity on this night. And God said, this will be a sign for me as I pass through Egypt. You're to slaughter a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. And you're to take the blood of the lamb. And you're to cover the doorpost of your home with the blood of the lamb. And as I pass through the city, I'm going to see the blood. And the homes which are covered in the blood of the lamb are going to be spared my coming wrath. And Paul tells us in Corinthians that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. And in God's perfect timing, that Monday, or that Sunday rather, as Jesus 
road into Jerusalem. It's the day that the religious leaders brought all of the lambs into the city that would be sacrificed that week. On the same day, all of the sacrificial lambs are coming into Jerusalem. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the great high priest, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He rides in. And the people missed his coronation. When Jesus came the first time, his enemies missed it because they were looking for a king to come in power, and they got a king who came in humility to offer himself as a sacrifice. When he comes back, his enemies will miss it once again. Because Jesus promised that he's returning. Revelation 19 describes for us the event of Jesus' return. His enemies missed it the first time because they were expecting a king to come in power and they got a a suffering servant. They were expecting a king to come and make war with the nations, but they got a king who came to make peace with the nations by the blood of his cross. But Jesus says when he comes back, it's going to look totally different. He's not coming back again as a suffering servant, though that may be what the world wants. Revelation 19.11 describes the event of Jesus' return. It says this, Then I saw heaven opened up and behold a white horse the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that nobody knows but himself he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of god And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The people missed that Jesus was God's king, God's redeemer, the Messiah, because they wanted a God a king who would come and make war with the nations. And they got a suffering servant. Listen, when he comes back, the world may be hoping for a meek and mild suffering servant. But he's coming back as a conquering king. He came the first time to make peace with the nations by the blood of the cross. Revelation 19 says he's coming back to make war with the nations, to rule the nations. He came, he suffered, he died, he rose, and he's coming back. This truth should motivate us. He's coming back in power. He's coming back in might. He's coming back in majesty. He's coming back with the wrath of God which has been stored up for all of the the unbelievers. Palm Sunday is in every way the ascension of a king to his throne. He is a king in power. He is a king in majesty. He is a king in might. He is a king in glory. And his kingdom has been advancing from that moment till this moment. The question to you is, have you received this king? My fear is that maybe we've softened the reality of this King Jesus, that in an attempt to make him more appealing, uh, to make him more palatable, 
to, to make him more approachable to our modern sensibilities. We have only talked about this one reality that Jesus came as a suffering servant to offer his life as a ransom for many, that he came to make peace by the blood of his cross. That's absolutely true. But listen, he's also the conquering king who's coming back in power to make war with the nations and to subject everything to his kingship and his rule and his authority. Have you worshipped him as king? A challenge to you this week is that even as the world's attention is turned to the things of faith, while maybe the world makes it about Easter eggs and uh, little marshmallow bunnies and chicks, we know that there's a deeper significance. That the king of glory he came in humility to offer his life as a ransom for ours. But he's coming back in power. He's coming back to restore all that was broken in the fall. And he's coming soon. Have you worshipped him as king? Will we be found worshipping Jesus as he's presented in the scriptures or will we still be looking and clamoring for a Jesus of our own creation? A Jesus of our own making. Let's offer to the world Jesus as he's revealed himself in the scriptures. A king who was both. A humble servant willing to suffer and die for his people and a king who's coming in power to claim all that rightfully belongs to him. Let's pray. God, we love you and we hold these truths dear. God, I pray that this week you would cause our hearts to be centered on the truth about who Jesus is. God, that we would search your scriptures, and that we would be found worshiping the King Jesus as he's presented in the scriptures. God, we thank you and we praise you that we were the nations that Jesus should have come to make war with. He, he should have came and he should have looked upon my unrighteousness and he should have judged me. He should have sentenced me instantly to death. But God, we thank you that you showed your mercy and your grace, that you sent your son, that he might come not as a conquering king, but first as a suffering servant to make peace between God and man by the blood of the cross. God, help us this week as we think about the events of that holy week to Meditate on the, the magnitude and the significance of the fact that your wrath was on us because of our sin. But that the suffering servant, the king who came in humility, he went to the cross to bear your wrath for my sin. Now that weight should fall heavy on all of us, always, Lord, but especially this week. And we pray that as we search your scriptures this week, that you would reveal more to us about the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the suffering servant who came and suffered and bled and died, but who's coming back in power. He's coming back to unite all things under his lordship. He's coming back to gather his own to himself, as your kingdom has been advancing, and also to judge all those who are in disbelief, rejecting him as king. Father, let that truth motivate us, that we would actively participate in the process of advancing your kingdom. And Father, even now, if there's anyone gathered in here who has not given their lives to the king of kings, 
the Lord of Lords, not a Jesus of our own creation, fashioned after our own image, but Jesus as he's been revealed to us in Scripture, the King of kings, the Lord of all creation, who came as a humble and suffering servant, making peace by the blood of the cross, who's coming back in power to restore all things. God, if there's anyone in here who's not trusted in that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them, that your spirit would cause them to be uniquely aware of their sin and that their sin separates them from you, God, and that your wrath is now presently upon them because of their unbelief and their sin, God, but that you have made a way through the blood of the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. That your wrath could be avoided, your wrath could be satisfied, and that we who were enemies could be called children of God. Lord, if there's one in here today who's never believed in that, you've trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior and turned from sin, God, I pray that your spirit would just do a work in their heart causing them to believe that they might be saved. Father, as we as a church this week set aside time to focus on this final week of Christ's life, I I pray that this week we would be keenly aware of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. As we gather, whether we're gathering tonight to to fill Easter eggs and uh, to point people to Christ or we're gathering in remembrance of the Lord's Supper or gathering to observe Good Friday, God, we pray that your presence, your spirit would be among us, causing us to be humbled, but to take heart and to have courage, knowing that Christ has overcome the world. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to invite you to come. You've never received Jesus. Maybe you are under conviction right now that you you have refashioned Jesus in your own image or you've you've worshipped a Jesus of your own creation rather than Jesus as he's presented in the Scripture. If that's you or if you've never trusted in Christ, we would love for you to come so that we could share with you what it means to, to walk with Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Maybe you're convicted of something else, and I would encourage you either come forward and, and, and pray to God in response to that conviction, or you can just pray right where you're at. Repent of whatever the Lord may be convicting you of. It's our belief that every time the Word of God is proclaimed, the people of God are called to respond. You can respond by coming forward and speaking with one of our staff, or you can respond by just doing work with the Lord right where you're at. But let's all respond together. Let's stand and respond together through song.